Welcome to uh, the CMP Action Inc. Um, special presentation. It's uh, addressing the border and ballot emergencies. This session is sponsored by CMP Action Inc., the 501C4 sister organization of the 501C3 Council for National Policy. CMP Action Inc. serves as an advocate for conservative principles such as limited government, the promotion of free economic enterprise, traditional values, and a strong national event, defense. CMP Action Inc. does not support candidates or political parties, but it may promote issues or specific pieces of legislation. It's one of those social welfare organizations you heard about over lunch. Contributions to CMP Action Inc. are not, are not tax deductible as charitable contributions, but they do benefit the country. Uh, there is a further explanation of uh, CMP Action Inc. in the meeting packet that you have, and uh, are the biographies of all of those who are here today are also in the packet, uh, so I won't give you the full biographical, bi biographical background. You can familiarize yourself in the giant packet you have. Uh, I encourage you to take a look at that uh, section of your packet because it will tell you uh, how this program is supposed to run. You know, essentially what we'll be doing is that we'll have the opening presentations and remarks uh, and then we'll get into a discussion uh, uh, led by you uh, with brief statements of questions of one or one minute or less and then we'll keep our uh, answers uh, similarly short and then we'll decide collectively on how to, uh, what action items we want to settle on to share with the larger group. Uh, the, uh, there'll be a buzzer that buzzes when we start coming to the uh, end of the program. We have to start uh, figuring out what we're going to uh, collectively act upon. Uh, so, you know, we've got, we do have time limits that I'm going to um, aggressively enforce. Uh, so you'll be voting at the end, I'll repeat this again, you'll be voting at the end uh, at uh, CFNP, I probably should give this to you at the end, but you know, I'll give it to you now, cfnp.org slash border. So that's where the action items will pop up and that's how we'll vote. Uh, so I want to introduce our participants right now. Uh, joining us here, we've got a really great group, by the way, Rachel Bovard. Rachel, uh, to my immediate left, is the Senior Director of Policy for the Conservative Partnership Institute. She worked on Capitol Hill in both the House and the Senate, and uh, she had also served as Director of Policy Services as, uh, at, over at the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Rachel is a great person. She is an up-and-coming conservative leader. Uh, if you uh, are familiar with the Conservative Action Project, uh, she is a key member who allows us to get all that work product that you sometimes see out. Uh, and uh, she's a great thinker, great writer, and uh, we're lucky to have her here today. Also, similarly uh, great is Jenny Beth Martin, who you uh, may be more familiar with. Jenny Beth is the co-founder and CEO, CEO of Tea Party Patriots, which has grown to be the largest and most effective national umbrella group within the Tea Party movement. Uh, she formerly worked at Mead Paper and the Home Depot. Was that, the, was Mead Paper the home of the office program? Yes, yeah. Uh, and uh, she's the author of Tea Party Patriots, Second American Revolution. And you've seen her all over the place. And she's a great movement leader for us as well. And she's also on the executive committee of the Council for National Policy. So she's volunteering her leadership skills uh, for us all. And she was recently elected to Secretary, so she's an officer as well. Also joining us is Hans von Spakowski. I've known Hans for years, but I always have to pause over his name to make sure I'm giving it the proper attention. Hans is a senior legal fellow and manager at the Election Law Reform Initiative for the, in the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation. He's a former commissioner at the Federal Election Commission to the internal chagrin of the left. They really hated that he were, was put on the commission. And uh, even worse, he served at the U.S. Department of Justice as uh, U.S. counsel, as counsel for the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights. So he was running the, uh, uh, the last civil rights, uh, conservative civil rights 
Justice Department. Well, I guess they're better now than they were under. You think they're better now than they were under you guys? Not better, but they're good. They're good. But uh, he was one of the two or three conservatives in the Justice Department during the uh, uh, first part of the Bush administration. Uh, and he's an expert on uh, election integrity. Hans is one of three or four lawyers who do this full time, more or less. Uh, now, the left has 400 lawyers who do it full time. So we've got a precious resource here with Hans. Also joining us is uh, Craig Huey, who's the president of Creative Direct Marketing Group and Infomat, uh, and uh, award-winning uh, 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 businessman in that regard in terms of his industry. Uh, Craig has been a speaker expert panelist at over 500 political and business ventures in the US and abroad. He's the author of The Deep State, 15 Surprising Dangers You Should Know. Uh, he uh, publishes. Uh, I like this, the judgevoterguide.com, uh, which for Judicial Watch, I, I'm glad to know about it because everyone always calls Judicial Watch asking who they should vote for in local, local judicial elections. Like, well, we don't do that. Well, I'm glad to know that uh, Greg is doing that. And um, he's also uh, been, part, been running uh, election forums throughout the country. And uh, he and his wife, Shelley, live out in California. So he has some uh, fun details on ballot harvesting in California and the state of play in terms of election integrity out there. So you know, we talk about the national emergency on the border, but there are two national emergencies. I, well, I would say three national emergencies. One is targeting of President Trump and trying to upend the election through a, a, a coup. Uh, but the other uh, attacks on our republic are occurring both at the border and at the ballot box. And at the border, uh, I'm not telling you any secrets here. There's a crisis. You've, if, you're, if you follow this issue, uh, even in, uh, superficially, you'll know that there are record numbers at the border that are showing up that are almost immediately being released into the country. We're at the state, uh, it's about as bad as it's ever been. Uh, we will have, I think at this rate, 1.2 million aliens come into our country, uh, most of whom have no business being here. Uh, but our system has been overwhelmed, and practically speaking, there is no border at, the, at uh, our southern uh, part of the country. Uh, and the question that we will try to address here is what to do about it. Uh, there's a new plan out of the administration that, that uh, is part changing the nature of legal immigration, which is probably of less interest to us, uh, but we'll talk about it. But there's a security component of the plan, and we'll talk about what, what needs to be done and what needs to be changed in terms of security at the border. And is there anything that can be done, executive action, or in terms of executive action, and what you can do locally and at the state level uh, to help address the illegal immigration crisis. Uh, the second aspect, of course, what you, you know, Judicial Watch has been doing this for, for years and years and years. We had a team in Guatemala during the first part of the caravan crisis, and we found what you would expect to find. Uh, a bunch of men, not many women and children, mostly criminal, international in nature, meaning not just Central Americans, highly organized uh, by left-wing organizations, uh, many of whom are American in orientation or American funded, some of which were probably funded with tax dollars, were shepherding these folks through Guatemala, up through Mexico, into the United States. And uh, things have only worsened uh, since then. And just more specifically, Judicial Watch currently has a, a taxpayer lawsuit against the city of San Francisco over its illegal alien sanctuary policy, and we hope to go to trial uh, early next year there. And now we have, on top of this, and this related issue, it's the election integrity crisis. We can have all these votes for candidates and all these campaign commercials and voter guides, but if our elections and our votes are stolen, then that's just a joke, right? And so we don't want our elections to be a joke. We want to be sure that your votes are counted, and we want to make sure, for the sake of America, that it appears your votes are counted, meaning we want you to have faith in the confidence of elections. And certainly, if we don't have faith in the confidence of elections, we'll have less turnout. And uh, 
This is why, as Hans, I know, has pointed out in his previous discussions, is that when you have better election security, uh, better voter ID, minorities turn out in increased numbers because they, you know, unlike the left, we don't patronize minorities. They're not dumb. If they know votes are going to be stolen because of lack of voter ID, they're not going to waste their time voting. So we want to elevate the issue, uh, which is the civil rights issue of our time, uh, to uh, protect our elections from being stolen. Uh, and you know, if I do, I done the back of the hand calculations. Aliens vote in large numbers, and they vote in large enough numbers to change election outcomes. There's little doubt. We can argue about the numbers. There are new numbers out of Texas, and uh, Hans was instrumental in getting some numbers out of uh, Pennsylvania through some of his other work uh, that indicate or confirm that aliens are voting in large numbers. And on top of that, we have this new innovation in California which has no, there's no similar law anywhere out there. I mean, North Carolina, there's this ballot harvesting scandal. The reason it's a scandal in North Carolina, it's because it's illegal. But it's legal in California, so the fraudulent activity that took place in North Carolina, there's virtually no guardrail against that as a result of the radical ballot harvesting law passed in California, so we'll talk about that. And uh, specifically, Judicial Watch has been investigating this more directly. This is on top of our efforts to clean up the rolls, which led to uh, a major victory in California, which is going to see LA County uh, begin the process of removing up to 1.56 million names from the rolls who haven't voted in 10 years, more or less, uh, and who are probably dead, uh, or many of whom are probably dead. So uh, this, is a, this is a major point of um, focus for the left. And so it needs to be a major point of focus for us. So as far as I'm concerned, we should be talking about this at every meeting in one form or another, election integrity, and immigration too, by the way. So with that opening remark, I don't know if I went over time. I wasn't tracking my time. I guess that's the benefit of running the meeting. Uh, I'll t I'm, not gonna start, I'm gonna now start enforcing time limits. <laughs> I can talk till three, and we have to only till three, so that's fine. Uh, Rachel, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Um, so I'm Rachel Bovard, and at the outset, let me apologize. I'm getting over a bad case of tonsillitis, so if my voice is a little hoarse, that's why. Um, but if you will indulge me in a, a second of fangirling before I get started. Um, I, Tom mentioned I'm a little bit of an up-and-comer, and I'm kind of blown away to be asked to be on this panel with people who are absolute luminaries in the conservative movement. Um, they're amazing, uh, and specifically Jenny Beth, who's a role model for conservative women. Uh, but I also wanted to mention, I recently read a piece in The New Yorker that mentioned Hans and called him noted hack, Hans von Spakovsky. <laughs> and, and, when I, <laughs> yeah. and when I read that, I was like, oh my gosh, this guy must be awesome. <laughs> It is now among my bucket list to be also a noted hack <laughs> at the level of Hans. Um, but with that out of the way, so I, I want to talk about uh, two very specific action items that I have for y'all, and they are based around the fact that I really feel like we have done a poor job, and a lot of this is on Republicans in Congress. We've done a poor job in controlling the narrative on illegal immigration. We have let the left define this, and I think it's time for us to take it back. And so my two action items today uh, are gonna be, one, calling out the Democrats for being the humanitarian frauds they are on the border, and the second is to make them own themselves as the party of open borders. And I wanna arm you today with a couple of facts that I think will be helpful as you engage, because our Republicans in Congress haven't really engaged, so I feel as influencers and activists, we have to start engaging on these points and hopefully push the momentum and push, push the wind behind Republicans in Congress to be able to do this. So Democrats are humanitarian frauds on the border, and this is specifically when it comes to the crisis of sexual assault and human trafficking that they are allowing to be happening on the southern border. And I have a piece that I wrote on this in March, sitting on some of the chairs. It's called, Where is the Me Too Movement for Women at the Border? And this is a huge, huge issue. Doctors Without Borders estimates that one in three women are sexually assaulted 
on their way to the border. A fusion uh, poll that was taken among migrants coming across the border estimates it even higher at 80% of women are raped when they're coming from Mexico to the US border. Uh, there was a New York Times article recently in March. Again, this is well documented and available from left-wing outlets like the New York Times, the Huffington Post, and even Doctors Without Borders. They say that the, the term that traffickers use for women coming across the border is nueva carne. It means new meat, okay? This is not a result of Donald Trump's policies. This is a result of our broken immigration system, our unsecured border, and the incentives that we have for immigrants to come here illegally. It's because of catch and release. It's because of our asylum laws that say you can simply claim asylum and you'll be led into the country. This is incentivizing women, especially women, to put themselves in harm's way. Democrats are culpable in refusing to fix these policies for a huge humanitarian crisis that they refuse to even acknowledge. There's a perfect example of this recently, Donald Trump's speech at CPAC, where he said mothers are actually giving their daughters birth control on their way up to the border because they know they're gonna be assaulted. Jamal Hill, who's a columnist for The Atlantic Magazine, tweeted out, if you believe this, you are dumb and stupid. Well, are, who's dumb and stupid here because Doctors Without Borders confirmed and used the same anecdote in December. This is happening. The Rand Corporation really recently released a report suggesting that cartels in 2017 alone earned $2.3 billion from human trafficking. This is a humanitarian crisis that Democrats fail to acknowledge. This is not Donald Trump's policies, this is on them. They're the party of Me Too, they're the party of humanitarian uh, actions, but they refuse to address this because they know they'd actually have to work with Donald Trump. We need to make them own that. My second point, because you're gonna hold me to time, I have four minutes left. Uh, they are the party of open borders and they are unabashed about this. A couple of examples I wanna give you. Uh, they refuse to fix family separation policy at the border. When this erupted, when Donald Trump started enforcing the law and Democrats were, were freaking out about family separation, Senate Republicans brought a bill to the floor to fix this policy to say, okay, we're gonna allow families to be kept and detained together. Who do you think blocked that bill? Chuck Schumer because they know that ripping apart families on TV, they like that. They like that drama, it's better for them. So we need to hold them accountable for that. Uh, they recently voted in the House, and I don't know if, if you all caught this, a couple of, is about a month ago, Dan Crenshaw brought a motion to recommit to the floor that says, hey, we shouldn't allow illegal immigrants to vote. Guess who voted against that almost unanimously? Every Democrat in the House. We should be making them own that. They are for open borders and they are not ashamed to go on the record for it. Why aren't we calling them out for that? Make them defend that on the campaign trail. Make them defend that on TV and in town halls. And then finally, uh, one thing that's gonna be coming up in the next week is you've seen the administration ask for more funds to address the humanitarian crisis on the border. Not to build a wall, just to address the humanitarian crisis and more funds to house these folks in detention, in detention houses. Guess who's blocking that? Congressional Democrats. When we were doing shutdown negotiations in January, they knew that ICE had over 50,000 immigrants in custody, yet they demanded that we only allow enough funding for 36,000 beds. It's because they want catch and release. If there's not enough detention beds, that's what happens. ICE just releases these illegal immigrants into the interior of the country where we never hear from them again, except when they show up to vote illegally. <laughs> Right? They know that ICE doesn't have the resources, but they're refusing to give them the resources to do their job and then bellyaching about migrants being held under bridges or flown to places like California. They're blocking our, our resources to be able to do something about it. So my two action items, and I hope I've given you some facts and statistics to use for this, are hold them to account for being humanitarian frauds and call them out now for being the party of open borders because that's what they are and we now have them on the record for it. I came you. in a minute under. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, yeah, and to the degree you can shorten your remarks uh, because we got a late start because you uh, took too long eating. Uh, we will. Uh, we have to. Um, you know, we have to really move it along, folks. I, and I forgot to mention our volunteer note taker, Anna Tuney, who is a project manager for United and Purpose, is tracking this and will be uh, providing notes for us to follow up on. And special thanks to Bill Dallas and United and Purpose for providing the note takers for the CMP Action Inc. panels. Uh, uh, United and Purpose is transforming United American culture by bringing together conservative Christian organizations to act in unity to reach shared goals. So thank you, Bill and United and Purpose, for helping us 
uh, do this good work here. Next up is uh, Jenny Beth Martin with her remarks on the topics at hand. Thank you very much, Tom. And thank you, Rachel. And you really need to check out Rachel's work that she, uh, you, you publish at American Greatness. And yeah. you also actually read a lot of her work if you're reading the memos to the movement, because I think at this point you're writing 80 percent or more of them. So if you like those memos to the movement, you can thank Rachel because she's she's a work behind that. OK, um, Tea Party Patriot Citizens Fund did a documentary in 2014 about the border called Border States of America. We uh, went into production and began filming in June, and we released it in October. And during the shutdown in January about the issue of border security, our documentary was getting about 100,000 views a week. We have over a million views right now on YouTube from that. Um, the only thing that's really changed from 2014 to today is that the situation has actually gotten worse. It is a very good documentary to help arm you with, tool, with the tools you need, the statistics and real life stories to understand what's happening on the border. And right now I'm going to show you a few clips that we've cut down from that to give you an idea of what is in the, the um, documentary. The first one is called Fences. Washington has created a wide open border by creating magnets that draw more illegal immigrants. Sheriffs and border patrol agents often have vast territories to cover. And the fence, the physical barrier into our country, in most places, it is little more than a joke. You know, I've been watching a little bit on C-SPAN, and a lot of them folks up there don't have a clue. And I just want to invite them to come to the border, get a true picture. We have a fence here and it runs a length of about 2.8 miles or something like that. So people just walk around it. It turns into a barbed wire field fence, five foot tall. Stuff. Um, okay, the next one we're going to show is, yeah, you're kind of shocked. <laughs> that's that's what we have. And so when people when people say, oh, walls aren't important, well, right now the way the walls wall is set up, it we have major fundamental problems with the way the the wall is set up right now because you can walk around it in some places, not everywhere, but in some places. Um, the next one is called illness. What incubates at the border? The crime, the economic hardships, the wanton disregard for the law, even diseases are being imported and spread to every state, every county, and every town in America. We're talking about people coming in who are under duress. They've traveled 1,700 miles. They're malnourished. They're dehydrated. They've been in conditions that breed infection. They're bringing over contagious diseases, which can affect everybody that they come in contact with. These immigrants are being brought everywhere into the country. We're talking about people who are being put on buses, dropped off at stations, on commercial airliners, and we don't even know where they go to. Everybody that they're coming in contact with potentially could be affected. There was a story from Maryland how Parents got letters sent home from their school saying that their child had been exposed to an illegal, illegal immigrant child who had tuberculosis. That's going to be repeated. So this is not something that people should think of as being, oh, it's just happening in Texas. It doesn't affect me. And everybody is just being put at risk. a lot right now about the spread of measles and other diseases that we thought we had eradicated in this country. And we definitely need to make sure that people are being immunized. And we also are, there are people who are coming into our country from countries where they have not eradicated these diseases. So we've set up kind of a perfect storm to have outbreaks again and so that, that highlights that one. The next one is a little long. I don't know that I actually have time to go through it. 
but we have these on, uh, we have the full documentary, it's less than an hour, by less than an hour I mean it's 59 minutes, but it is less than an hour. <laughs> what, so, that was my direction, we always do our documentaries and I say you've got to make it less than an hour, so they normally come in like at 59 minutes and 59 seconds. Um, the the documentary, what you can do, what I urge you to do right now, the president came out on Wednesday with his, or Thursday, with his plan for border security and immig immigration reform for legal immigration. That happened Thursday. What we need to do is call our members of Congress who are Republicans, so Republican congressmen and Republican senators, and ask them to publicly support his plan. Now, um, we, if they have not put a press release out about it, urge them to put a press release out and then go and share that on social media. We need to be behind those plans, so we're talking from a, a single set of principles. The next thing that you can do is take it a step further and more um, closer to home. And that is to ask your state and local elected officials to do the same. If they're Republican, ask them to put out a statement supporting the border security and immigration plan that the president, the president just came out with. And they should be able to tie it to either the opioid crisis or the human trafficking problems within your own state and community. Then, um, and actually, I saw Maria Espinoza, who works with um, the families of people whose um, loved ones have been killed from illegal immigration. So you may be able also to tie it to, to angel families across the country and in your local community as well. Um, we need to do that so that we are unified on principles for how to secure the border. And the plan is a, a strong border security plan. The, the next action item beyond that is to watch this documentary, hold a house party. What I mean by that is invite people to your home to watch the documentary and then talk about the problem at the border and the solutions that the president and other Republicans are putting forth to solve the border security crisis. And then um, the other thing that you can do is urge your member of Congress and your local elected officials to watch the documentary. We've actually had some groups who set up meetings with their member of Congress for an hour and a half. And then they go and sit down with the member of Congress and they open their computer and they watch the documentary with the member of Congress right there. They have an hour and a half of his time or the time and their staff. So they watch that and then they talk about the issue for 30 minutes. And it's a way to really make sure that these members of Congress who are n ignoring the fact that there is a crisis on the border see the real life effect of what's happening at the, the border. And you can do the same thing for the finance chair of your member of Congress for the campaign. Make sure that the finance chair understands that as well because there's one person who the member of Congress is going to listen to in the campaign and that's the person who's raising money for, for him or her. So make sure that that person also understands what's going on. Thank you, uh, Jenny Beth. Uh, it was a great presentation. And as you listen to the uh, next few presentations, I'll just remind you what the goal of this session is, as you're listening uh, to and, and um, thinking about what you've heard and what you're going to hear. Our goal is to strategize on the issues we're talking about to arrive at a unified path of action that we can take all together to maximize our impact. Uh, you know, if we leave this meeting, uh, with no tasks to do in terms of public policy, that's a missed opportunity. So our goal is to maximize the opportunity of this uh, special time we have together to come up with uh, goals that we can individually take uh, to fix these emergency issues that we're talking about here. Uh, with that in mind, Hans, uh, you, I understand, have lots of ideas for people to pursue. OK. <clears throat> uh, before I get into this, um, I do want to point out that uh, what got ha handed out earlier, uh, and some of you may have a copy of a, a comprehensive American Agenda Reform paper that Heritage put out. <coughs> it's got a lot of things about how legal immigration should be changed, uh, loopholes we need to close in the illegal immigration area, and we also have a card out on this. Um, I don't need to convince you that we have a border crisis. Uh, you know, the official estimates from DHS is that we have about 12 million illegal aliens in the country, 
Uh, other sources put it as high as 25 million. It's a very large number. Uh, in March, uh, the Border Patrol apprehended the largest number in 12 years, almost 100,000 people coming across the border. And most Border Patrol agents will tell you that they believe they only apprehend about one in three of the people coming across. Now, what you have to understand is this is an enormous problem. Even if DHS was fully funded and was getting uh, lots of cooperation from other federal agencies, it would still need the help of states and local jurisdictions. So I'm not going to talk about the federal government uh, today. Uh, the chances of getting anything through Congress is pretty nil because the Democrats are going to oppose anything the President uh, proposes. What I'm going to talk to you about is action items that you can do at the state and local level to help in this area. And what you have to understand is this. The vast majority of illegal aliens are here not because they're fleeing political persecution or anything like that. They're here for economic reasons. And one of the reasons that uh, countries, for example, in the Caribbean area like Honduras, El Salvador, don't, don't do anything to stem this, the reason Mexico doesn't do anything to stem this, is because uh, the biggest source of income in many of these countries are remittances coming from the United States. Okay? So what, you have, what we have to do is choke off the economic reasons that these illegal aliens are here. Um, and that also means uh, attacking the economic reasons they're here, attacking their ability uh, to transport themselves to uh, the jobs they get illegally. So here's a whole series of things that you all ought to be able to do, or you should do at the state and local level. First of all, um, you all know the E-Verify system, which is a system employers can use to check whether the person they're hiring is legally in the U.S., is voluntary at the federal level. But there's nothing to bar states from making that mandatory. And Arizona did that some years ago, made it mandatory, and said that if an employer used that system, they were grandfathered in and protected. If it turned out later that somebody they had gotten verified it was actually an illegal alien, they can't be prosecuted because they checked with the federal government. The federal government said they, they can work. But if you don't use the E-Verify system, and it turns out you hired an illegal alien, you could use your business, lose your business license. And that was a way of forcing employers to quit hiring illegal aliens. The U.S. Chamber and the Obama administration sued, saying, oh, states can't make this mandatory, went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, uh, yes, they can. So the U.S. Chamber lost, and so did the Obama administration. So your state legislature, try to convince them to make E-Verify mandatory. Um, Georgia does not allow you to attend the Georgia University and College system unless you are a U.S. citizen or legally in the United States. However, there are numerous states around the country who then not only allow illegal aliens to attend their universities, but actually uh, provide them with in-state tuition rates. Now, you might think it's only blue states that do that. No. Texas is one of the states that provides in-state tuition to illegal aliens. And you might, if you're living in Texas, you might want to go to the Republican legislators there and say, what the heck are you doing? Why are you doing that? That act, acts as a magnet to attract even more illegal aliens uh, to, to the state. Um, no board and no commission in your state the commissions that license everything from hairdressers to uh, extending bar licenses to lawyers, you should be checking with them, are they extending those kind of professional licenses to illegal aliens? Because if they are, you need to persuade them and talk to them uh, to not do that. Uh, encourage your local law enforcement, your sheriff, uh, your city or town uh, police, to uh, get involved in the 287G program. If you haven't heard of this, this is a program that was established under federal immigration law, and it's a program whereby DHS provides training and money for local law enforcement to help and assist them in finding, arresting, and detaining illegal aliens. And that is an effective way of extending the reach of DHS all over the country, and your local law enforcement ought to be doing that. Um, 
your state should not be providing driver's licenses to illegal aliens. As you know, there are a number of states that do that, California being one of them. If your state uh, does that, you should try to persuade the state legislature to prohibit that. Uh, but the other big thing is this, you know, you can drive a car for a pretty long time without a driver's license, and you're only gonna get caught if you're stopped by the cops, right? It's very tough, however, to drive a car without a license plate on it, and so you should tell your state legislators that they should do what Alabama did. Alabama put in a provision that said, uh, if you wanna get a license plate for your car, you have to show that you are a US citizen. <laughs> or you are a non-citizen who's legally in the country. That's a way of making it difficult for illegal aliens to get the transportation they need um, to, to get to jobs. Um, if your state corrections department is not issuing an annual report on the crimes committed by illegal aliens in your state, then all of you all are influential people. Call state legislators, call people you might know in the governor's office, and get them to do that. The state uh, corrections, uh, the state uh, Texas Department of Public Safety uh, last year issued a report where they basically went and said, okay, um, what are the crimes that have been committed by all of the illegal aliens who are in Texas state prisons and jails? The numbers were shocking including literally thousands of people who had been murdered by illegal aliens. That's important because that gives you the data and the evidence you need to show why having illegal aliens in your state, criminal aliens, is a bad, is a bad thing. Um, check and make sure, uh, does your state and do your county election officials, are your county election officials checking with the county court wherever you live, to get the information from jury declination forms. And what I mean by that is, you know, if you're called for jury duty, you have to fill out a form in which you answer a series of questions. One of the questions you're asked is, are you a U.S. citizen? And where do they get juries from? Voter registration lists. But in a lot of counties, they simply excuse you from jury duty if you're not a U.S. citizen, and they don't turn that information over to a local election official so they can take you off the list so that you can't vote. And you need to be sure, ask your county election officials, are they getting that information? And what are they, if they're not, why not? And if they are getting it, what are they, what are they doing with it? And you also need to ask them, uh, the, your local county election officials, what are they doing to verify the citizenship of people registering to vote? And if they're not doing anything about it, you need to make a big deal about it and say, you need to be doing this. Why aren't you talking to the Department of Homeland Security? Why aren't you uh, getting information from DHS's database on aliens? And basically give them a hard time about it. These are all things that you can do at the local level. You know, in the towns that you live in, like I said, business licenses. At the state level, driver's licenses, license plates, you want to work on making sure that it is, is almost impossible economically for an illegal alien to live and work wherever you are. And that is a way of, it may drive them out of your state and over to California, <laughs> but uh, all of that's going to help. And, and folks in Arizona have told me that, for example, after they put in the mandatory E-Verify system, they saw a migration of illegal aliens out of the state. They started saving monies in their schools, health care costs, and legal costs. And that is a very big expense, particularly for local governments, when it comes to uh, illegal aliens. So, those are all the action steps that I would urge you to engage in. It's a great job, Hans. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is our friend Craig Huey. Uh, Greg, uh, Craig, uh, you have a PowerPoint as well, so I don't know what help you need on doing that other than your own, but right. it's up to you. Well, they're here. trying to put that up. I'll, be, I'll begin. Okay. So, uh, but hopefully you can get it up quickly. <laughs> so how many of you have heard about ba uh, ballot harvesting? How many of you really know what ballot harvesting is? I know Tom does. <laughs> well, here's the thing with ballot harvesting. It is going to make 
2020, an election that has been stolen. You see, with ballot harvesting, you don't have to have a candidate that has better ideas, a better candidate being more articulate. You don't have to be right, you don't have to be wrong. What you have to do is mobilize enough votes to be able to make it work. So I'd like to, they use this formula, the progressive left. Money, data, targeted advanced marketing, organized GOTV gives you the victory. And I'm gonna give you a little bit of this. Um, if you have not read Indivisible, Give me your card and I'll send it to you. This is how the left planned the 2018 election, including the ballot harvesting. Voter fraud, when you think of ballot harvesting, usually you think of voter fraud. It's not just voter fraud. In California and other states, there's uh, 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 voter fraud caused by the motor uh, voter uh, with unions, with acorn type. There's all these different types of things that are fraud. But the thing with ballot harvesting is this. It is not fraud. It can lead to fraud. And that's the problem with ballot harvesting. You see, 18 states have outlawed it. And even in those 18 states, it still happens. There are elections throughout the United States that were lost by good conservatives uh, that they lost because of ballot harvesting, and not just California, though I'm going to give you an example of California. You see, with voter fraud, you can have vote buying, vote coercion, vote deception, Grammy farming at retirement homes, no-show farming with ballot harvesting. And it's estimated by the left that they get 6 to 10% increase in voter turnout by using ballot harvesting. 27 states, it's legal. And most of them have restrictions. In California, they may put in new ones, but they don't have it now. I'm going to show you somebody doing ballot harvesting. This is one of many tapes. This is from Ring. And, you know, she's going to say this is a new service for Democrats only. Service was passed last year at the end. Half the envelopes last year didn't get sent out. People weren't signing the, book, uh, the back. And I'll show you how to do it. In California... City council, school board candidates, assembly, state senate, all the different races. The candidates that were conservative, libertarian, and Christian, they lost. Because what happened was the progressives used a voter guide to show people how to vote even for the down ticket. So, the, there was an army going out collecting ballots. And this army, some of these people would go to a house 10 or 20 times. Yeah. They would pick up these ballots. Who knows if some were thrown away? Who knows if they were manipulated? Who knows anything about the ballots? That was part of advanced data modeling where they identified persuadables and likely voters that would support the progressive candidates. And in that campaign 
For example, in Congressman Dana Rohrabacher's district, there were over 1,000 people who were out there. Dana, who did the Save the Christians from Genocide, lost the election because of ballot harvesting. And um, they would know that this family had two parents that they didn't, she didn't want to talk to. She just wanted to talk to the son, who was uh, uh, independent, and they had ex expected that person to vote for the progressive candidate. So here's the thing. They all have this mobilization, this ballot harvesting, tied to database building, data strategy, targeted direct mail, volunteers, uh, paid uh, workers, uh, and advanced uh, uh, strategies. And the ballot harvesting, well, the increase in California, 1.1 million uh, Latino vote in 2014, 2.6 million. Don't have time to go over, but look at that. And if you need these stats that I'm going to go through real quick, give me your email. I'll send you the stats and a little bit more. But basically, they were able to get a giant number of people out to vote who had never voted before. And part of that was Tom Steyer, and he, uh, the billionaire. He was able to get uh, concentrated on college campuses. He had 200,000 extra votes in November because of his concentration on college campuses, selecting 10 college, uh, colleges in the districts where the seven congressmen that should have won lost. 1,700 uh, volunteers in the June primary doubled that in, for November. 580,000 doors knocked on. 10% increase in turnout vote. Swing left was uniting all the different progressive left groups. Last weekend of the election, one million people, one million hours, they held potlucks, they held home meetings, they did everything as an army to get people to fill out these harvests ballots. And that one person could take two, three, four hundred ballots into the voter registration office. And here's the thing, no one knew who the ballot harvesters are. There's no audit trail. There's no accountability. They're just handed in, and the voter registration accepts it. On election day, these candidates were all ahead. But after election day, because of the ballot harvesting, they lost. This will affect everyone. And now, Tom knows, mentioned about North Carolina, and there's another lawsuit in, by the Democrats in New Mexico. But there was no lawsuit by anyone in California against what I think is a fraudulent activity. Now, ballot harvesting, even down ticket. Here's the thing, city councilmen, the two pastors in Corona should have won. In Chino Hills, conservative school board should have won. They lost, and they should have won, but they lost because the progressives had a voter guide and told people how to be able to vote. So we need lawsuits, we need more control, but more control, outlaw, you know, we need to outlaw this. But here's the thing, here's the thing. We have to do this better. In the states that allow it, we've got to be able to do it better. We got to know how to do ballot harvesting. And there's a number of ways of doing it that we could outdo them. If we learn the tools that I don't have time to, like geofencing. We did geofencing for all, everybody that went to the Harvest Crusade and to Franklin Graham's and you know, evangelical churches to draw out their cell phone numbers. You guys can do that. Anybody can do that. That's just part of what the progressive left does. Are we doing it? We have to. Uh, I can give you information on how to do that. Church ballot harvesting. That's the number one thing. That's a sleeping giant. That's the, if the pastors, I spoke to over a thousand Hispanic pastors in the last election. Even the Hispanic pastors are so upset about loss of religious liberty. They are willing to do this. Pastor says, bring in your ballots. We'll show you how to vote by giving you this voter guide, and I'll deliver the ballots for you. If we don't do the church ballot harvesting where that's legal, the progressive left is out going to do it's in 2020. All right. Perfect. Did it in time. <laughs> Seven seconds left. Thank you, Craig. That was great. Okay, so we're, you know, we've had a lot of uh, action items presented here. 
Uh, now we have a little time for you to answer, ask questions, and uh, we'll have the microphones by our volunteers, held by our volunteers, so don't grab the mic. Uh, you have a minute to talk, and we'll try to keep our responses to under three minutes, so the briefer the responses, folks, uh, the better, in terms of getting more folks involved. And, uh, you know, look at the list. Uh, we'll scroll it up and down as we talk, and we'll try to narrow it. We're going to have to kind of try to collectively narrow this down so we're not voting on 60 action items. Uh, how many action items do we have? We have 27. So um, I don't know. My guess is we're going to have to keep it down to 10 in order to kind of effective have a good vote uh, at the end of the program. Uh, but let me open it up to questions and comments. I have a question here. Um, in Texas, you, there is a big debate going on with regard to driver's licenses. Uh, you have a number of illegal, it doesn't matter whether they own a car, whether the car, uh, they get somebody's car that has a license plate, but they're driving it. They T-bone somebody, they kill somebody, and they've got no insurance. Uh, and no, no recovery. So there's a question, do you want to punish the people they run into or run over or get insurance? So the question is, do driver's license for illegal aliens make the road safer? The, the answer to that is no. Because if you think they, well, they, they, they look, they're going to get a driver's license and then immediately cancel the insurance that they have. And if you think that's going to keep you safe, it's just not, it's just not going to happen. And what they do is they, they're going to use the driver's license for other nefarious purposes to establish, for example, getting registered to vote. One of the reasons California has such a big problem, as you know, is because they put in automatic voter registration. They are automatic. They don't ask you anymore when you go into DMV whether you want to register to vote. They automatically register you. And they're registering literally hundreds of thousands of illegal aliens, and those aliens are getting registered because California doesn't really have a process in place to prevent them from, from doing that. Any other comments? My yeah, question I, I, is I, I, for Just Craig. quickly on the voter ID. Voter ID is not enough to stop aliens from illegally voting, both legal and otherwise. If you're legally here in the country, you often have the ID necessary to vote if you're illegally registered to vote. And the same as we talk about with voter ID materials that are now provided to illegal aliens, that's enough to establish identity under most state voter ID laws, the extent they exist, to allow them to vote, assuming they're registered to vote. And by the way, there are only 10 states with strong, I think it's 10 or 11, I think it's about 10 last time I checked, with strong voter ID laws. And my guess is you probably live in many of them, but uh, most states have virtually, it's all, no holds barred in terms of voting, in terms of uh, to the degree there's voter ID laws, they're not enforced effectively or not at all because you just show up and vote, I don't have an ID, and they let you vote anyway. It's just, it's really a crisis in that regard. Okay, to Craig. Uh, in California, where I have a lot of family, Univision and Telemundo were motivating illegal aliens to go vote and uh, to register and go vote, that the vote was um, not going to be um, found out, that they voted illegally, and that if they didn't vote, they would lose all of what they had. And so it was a great motivator, and many people voted illegally. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, the Hispanic media is very poisoned, just like left-wing media throughout the United States. And too many Hispanics, that's all they're getting. That again goes back to the church, where these pastors, they want to see protection of Israel. They want to see religious liberty. They want to see pro-life. And they recognize that they need to be able to do something. So the pastors are, again, the key to the truth in this. Uh, in my book, The Deep State, I, I have a whole chapter uh, uh, on voter fraud. And my research on the voter fraud ties into what you're talking about, including the ballot harvesting where, you know, dreamers and people who are not here Ill illegally were out knocking on doors as part of the progressive army to be able to collect those ballots. 
I mean, that's, that, that is what we're against. That's why we have to be able to be smart because it's going to, here, here's one of the key things to remember. And wherever ballot harvesting was done, anywhere in the United States, in California, it, it was on steroids. They were trained in this last election what to do. They're going to bring it to a higher level next time. Janet, do you want to say um, something? I, I would just say that the, it's important to find the organizations that are actually working to, on our side to pay people who are on the ground. And what you just saw in that video, those are paid people. And I have a volunteer organization. When we go door to door to get out the vote, we pay people. Because you have to be able to hold them accountable. And it's very difficult to hold volunteers accountable. Um, but there are organizations who who on our side are doing good work. Find those organizations and, and help support them. And if the um, Republican Party is has targeted your state as one of the swing states, make sure that they have a very good ground game. Delve into what it is now and help them. We've got time now to prepare for it. We're not going to have time at this time next year. The groundwork needs to be laid right now. Um, as we talk about border security, one of the things that we have not talked about is the massive surge of folks that are arriving at the border, and it's impossible to believe that that's entirely spontaneous. It, it appears organized, caravans and everything else. So are there also other friction points where we can look for inter interdiction and, and slowing this down, and how, how should we be addressing the broader issue of how the massive surges are occurring right now? Rachel or Hans? Look, that's a really difficult issue. But, but on the other hand, um, uh, there's a lot of pressure we could put on states, uh, on, on countries like Honduras and El Salvador, because they get a lot of money from us in foreign aid. And if they are not taking the steps to prevent uh, their citizens from leaving the country uh, to come to ours, that's something we ought to use. We have a huge trade relationship with Mexico. As you all know, at, at previous points, the president has threatened to <laughs> close the border unless they start uh, cooperating. And there's all kinds of uh, diplomatic and, frankly, financial pressure that needs to be put on Mexico to, for example, we would not be having the problem at the southern border if Mexico prevented the large numbers of uh, illegal aliens who are coming from Central America and the Caribbean from coming across its southern border. But instead, you know what the government of Mexico has been doing? They allow those people in across their southern border and then provide them with transportation and assistance to make their way through Mexico to our southern border. And we, we have to stop that. So what's their action on it? Well, let's have Rachel talk. We'll come up with an action item. Yeah, to answer your question about are there sort of are these caravans being organized? The answer is yes. Um, I wrote a piece on this, I think, in February when of the when the first caravan was forming. There were ties to an activist group in Chicago uh, who had sent volunteers down there to do this. So this is an organized effort. Uh, but to Hans's point, and this is something that the executive uh, and the Congress has to enforce. Uh, there's something called the I think it's called the First Safe Country uh, doctrine. Basically. And this is imp implemented all throughout Europe. When you're seeking asylum in a country, the first safe country you come to, you are required to claim asylum there. Mexico refuses to sign this agreement with us, and yet we continue our trade relationship. We continue to send them you know, humanitarian resources. We have an agreement like that with Canada. We do not have one with Mexico, and it's ironic because Mexico has a very generous asylum law, more generous than I think our own that they passed uh, a couple of years ago. So this is something that we really need to be pushing Congress and the executive to press on, because until we get this reform, there's not much we can do you know, to enforce these people to be able to stay uh, in the countries that they pass through. So my action items earlier were asking you to call your member of Congress who's Republican and have them support the president's border security plan. If you have Democrats, so if you're, especially if you're in California, call, call your senators, call your congressmen and ask why they don't want to secure the border. Get them on the record for it. The fact is they do not want to secure the border. They simply don't. They use this as an, it's like Obamacare for Republicans who said, oh, we're going to repeal it. And then they got in there and they did nothing to solve it. Border security and immigration reform, it's the same way for Democrats. 
but um, put them on the the spot and find out why they are not securing it and tie it to like the Me Too movement. Why aren't you securing the border when so many women are being assaulted and raped coming up through here? We need to secure it to prevent this from happening. What are you going to do to solve that? You know, my view is we can't wait for the election. Uh, this is a crisis that needs to be addressed immediately. So thinking out loud, I think we need to encourage the president to use all the powers entrusted to him under the Constitution to secure the border. It may require deploying the military. We don't control our border. We have this experiment over the last 40 or 50 years with civilian control of the border, civilian security of the border. It isn't working. You know, virtually every officer in World War II, you know where they served before they were in Europe or, China or Japan? They were on our border. Our military has secured the border for, for many, many years, as Aaron Anderson pointed out. And we don't control our side of the border, and Mexico doesn't control their side of the border. So I think we should talk about deploying the military. We should talk about deporting people. The administration bureaucratically is hesitant to do mass deportations the way even the Obama administration did. The Obama administration sent plane loads of people back home and it stopped the flows that they were facing at the time almost immediately. That's not being done by this administration because DHS is afraid of the political ramifications. And in terms of Mexico, the president has effectively used tariffs to change the behavior of other countries. He should impose tariffs on Mexico until they start controlling the border on their side of the aisle. Yes. Uh, we talked about voter ID earlier. I was curious to know if there's been any traction with things like facial recognition software instead of having ID cards and such, especially for folks that in Louisiana, we've heard they bust them from location to location to location, and the same people are voting with different names. No. No, no nothing's been done by that, like that by election officials. I mean, look, just getting just getting states to put in an ID requirement is extremely difficult. And some of the biggest states and worst states in the country, like New York and California, have no ID requirement of, of any kind. Yeah, that would be a fantasy uh, request. Any, do you have a comment? Did you want to say something, Jane? Craig? I, I would just be worried about civil liberties at, at that point and look at what China is doing with facial recognition. I, I don't want our government to, I don't want there to be illegal voting and I also want to keep my freedom. So yeah. I, I, The electronic I, aspect of voting that's been pushed is divisive, I think, for the movement. Yes. Um, thank you all for being here and thank you for the mention, Jenny Beth. I'm Maria Espinoza with the Remembrance Project. I'd like to find out, we have national network as well. We're going working back to kind of regain control of that. But I'd like to find out if you will be part of our national conference calls so you can educate the people. We are working on 2020 as well. We'll have our new de um, de uh, website where they can, people can download the images, the Stone Lives Quilt banners, and also enter our uh, vic the victims into our CRM, and they can download a list of the victims, send, email it, send it to their legislators, take it to city um, council hearings or the state houses. So will you be a part of an um, educational webinar that we have? Uh, yeah, and I think that should be an action item, being part of... F following up and learning more about the Remembrance Project and what they do. The, it, Maria, her, her group is really and truly a, a ministry, even though I don't think it, 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 it started out entirely that way. She winds up talking to people and sometimes being in touch with these um, family members of, who have lost loved ones to violent crime in the first 24 and 48 hours after the death of their loved one. And, um, it, it takes a special talent to be able to do that. Um, but knowing what happened, and there are people in her network who are further removed from, from the, the loss of the death in their family, knowing what happened to those people, learning more about the stories and hum humanizing the, the effects of, of this border crisis is something that's very important. There was a recent poll that was out this week, Breitbart reported on it, a Harvard-Harris poll that said that only two in 15 Americans even think there's a crisis at the border and understand what is happening at the border. 
we cannot, we're not going to solve, I want it solved right this second. We're not going to solve it until more Americans understand just how bad the problem is. And I do think this goes to when you call out people for being human, or Democrats for being humanitarian frauds on this issue. It's the sexual assault, it's the human trafficking, but it's also the cases of, of deaths that result you know, from people being here illegally. Oh my gosh, it's something on fire. No, okay, we only have 15 minutes left. Um, but real quick, we know cases like Kate Steinle, we know cases like Molly Tibbetts, and any cases like these, or people who are killed by illegal immigrants, you know, homicides like these are awful, but they're made even worse by the fact that they're caused by people who were not supposed to be here. This is a baseline exercise for our government. They're supposed to be protecting us uh, at the border from people like this, essentially. Uh, cases like Kate Stanley, who the, woman, the man who uh, murdered her, he was deported like nine times before he killed her. This is a baseline exercise. These people were not supposed to be here. So stories like this are incredibly important. Make Democrats own that. And there was, a, um, just yesterday we found out there's a serial killer in Texas who has killed, they think, 12, 12 elderly people. At least. At least 12. They're investigating now over 700 different deaths to find out how many others may be tied to this person. I'm not saying they killed 700 people. They think at least 12. He was here illegally. So that buzzer is, uh, we have to move on. So... Avita, you get the last word. Okay, I'll do it quickly. Evangelist Alvita King, I was elected as a state legislator twice in Georgia. I was a Democrat, 70s and 80s. I'm also, I've also been a presidential appointee twice. But one point that was just made, uh, as conservatives, as people who do what's right, because this is right, we pay attention to our money, we don't waste it. It's abhorrent to us to say, we're not gonna pay people to vote, we won't do it. Now, when the other side is actually doing that, if there are 27 states where uh, this uh, ballot harvesting. Uh, harvesting is going on, if it's legal, then we should learn how to do it with integrity because they said church ballot harvesting. So in, in, in Georgia, at least, in the black churches, when somebody shows up with some money and says, we want to pay you to get the vote out, Okay, that's bad. We don't want to think that way. But, hey, do you have a get out to vote campaign? Do you have a voter registration campaign? We know you have to pay a light bill, water bill. When the people come, they need to use the bathroom and et cetera. We have a budget. And you can hold the workers accountable if they're getting a minimum wage or something. That's not bad. That is not paying people to vote. That is thinking smart and mobilizing your machine. So we've got to stop this, we're so righteous, oh, we would never, and they keep doing it. So we should do it for the right reason, with integrity, with a plan, and that will help. Thank you. I think that speaks for itself, don't you think? Let's move on. What we have to do is we have to narrow down the 28 or so action items we have. And as I'm thinking, maybe we'll do a voice vote as we go through them. We'll try to clarify some of them. And well, I'll do a voice vote. Uh, you know, if it's close, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the final judge. We got, we got to move on. Um, hold Democrats accountable on being, a, and we'll see if this will be in our top 10 so we can vote at the end. Uh, so I'm asking you whether you agree or disagree, I or nay, about putting this action item in top ten. I'm going to go through them quickly. Hold Democrats accountable on being an open borders party. Make them defend it, I or nay? Nays. Ayes have it. Call our Democrats, so we'll put that in the top ten. Okay, well, we can clarify them once we win, well, once they win. <laughs> call, call our Democrats for blocking efforts, uh, call out Democrats for blocking efforts to address humanitarian, human trafficking, and sexual crisis at the border. I think we can skip that because it's a repetitive of number one. Call your GOP member of Congress and your GOP senators and urge them to support the president's position on border security publicly. Eh. Aye. Nays. It's, it's split, fails. Call your state and local rep Republican elected officials. Ask them and their staff to watch the Border States of America documentary. Ask them to support the president's borders. Okay, that's already Aye. said. Uh, ayes? Aye. Nays? Okay, the, that's the top ten. The second part is not part of the top ten, though. 
Okay, part five is repetitive, don't you think? Uh, host the house party, the show the border states of America documentary. I think we can incorporate that in the top 10 somehow, that initial thing. Yeah. Call the finance chairman of your GOP House, Cong uh, GOP member of Congress, and educate them on the issue. Help them on, okay. Communicate with your member of Congress about immigration issues. I, nay, uh, eyes have it. Well, I mean, the other one incorporates the specific documentary, so it's different enough, I think. No, it's a different, it's a different action item. One's, one specific, one's general. Where are we? Number eight, call your three members of... Okay, those are all. Lobby your state legislature to make E-Verify system mandatory for... Is that nays? No, nah, no. Nah. There you go. Lobby the Board of Trustees for the state college system to implement rules only allowing... Nays. Can I put that in the top 10? State legislature as well. I would add state legislature. Because in theory, well, depending on your state, the government, the, the state legislature has oversight. Ensure your state is not one of the 18 providing in-state tuition benefits. I think that's repetitive, right? Uh, 12, 13, the lobby all state boards and commissions that issue professional licenses to implement review rules that prevent illegal aliens from receiving such licenses. Okay, nays. Encourage your city town to participate in the 287G program in which local law enforcement, so this is an anti-sanctuary policy move. Um, add sanctuary policy somehow, to oppose sanctuary policies, or upend sanctuary policies by doing that. Yeah, something like that. Make sure your city or okay, that's repetitive. Make sure your state does not provide, that's repetitive. Is it repetitive? Oh, that's anti-driver's license. Ensure your state does not provide driver's license or car, tail, tar, car tags to illegal aliens if they do lobby to change the law. Nay, the eyes have it. Lobby to state corrections department this year and reports the number of illegal aliens. Aye. Nays. Now remember, we're trying to narrow it down to 10. <laughs> so I think we're going to, I, know, I, I want to do all this too, by the way, too. So I, I'm not, again, this is another great one. Check to see if local election officials use jury declination information to find nine citizens. Nays. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> I'll say so this is citizenship verification and voter ID in every state. I think we can combine the two. Aye. Aye. Nays. None. So voter ID and citizenship verification, I think you can combine that. Yeah. 2022. And, A-N-D. And, not and. <laughs> so 19 and 20 should be combined. Yeah. Or quote, just cut out 19, so the help. Uh, election commissions on redistricting count only citizens for districts and state legislature. Aye. Aye. I don't think that's constitutional. Nay. Okay, that fails. Outlaw ballot harvesting in all states. Aye. Nays. Okay, this one I think we should add outlaw and use ballot harvesting. <laughs> <laughs> How do we, what's the language we use? Op, 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 oppose, but use if legal, ballot harvesting. <laughs> I mean, it's, I mean, that's what, that's, I mean, that's what your action item is, right? <laughs> nah, you know, the, I, Outlawing is more important than using it. Uh, stop safeguard DMV registration, online registration. So this is online voting registration. Eyes, nays. Eh. Trying to keep it down to ten. Okay, so we'll bold it. We'll bold it. Ace have it. 
Use the new marketing formula for 2020 victory. Money data, target. I think that's too political. Lawsuits against illegal ballot harvesting. I, yeah, that's a repetitive. Use church ballot harvesting. That's repetitive. Yeah, that's the other one, so. Read invis indivisible. Yeah, I don't think that's gonna be an action item. Is that the leftist uh, thing? Uh, eyes, eyes. Okay, nays have it. Find good organizations and support them. What is that, what do we mean by that? Great, that's your, is that yours? So what type of organization should we, I, I want to know what we're voting on. Voter registration groups? Okay. Um, yeah, I think we should, I think, it, what, call senators and congressmen and get them on the record for why they don't want to sign border security. That's repetitive. Encourage the president to secure the border using the constitutional powers entrusted to him. Aye. 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 Nays. Okay. Talk about employing the military, deporting illegal aliens, and imposing tariffs on Mexico. Aye. Nays. Can we put the, put the, okay. Tom, can we put it on the border? Because now they're 60 miles inland. You think you'd have border security at the border so they don't come in? Yeah, we need border security on both sides of the border. We need border security and security. That's why we have people. Well, that's the portion sign. Yeah. Well, yeah. Learn more about the Remembrance Project. Well, that's an I, spiritually. Nays. We need to humanize the effects of the border crisis. We need to understand how bad the problem is. I. Yeah. Poor. The movie is Border States of America. So how many, uh, Anna, did we come down, how many did we narrow it down to? <laughs> okay, well, we've, well, you know what, you're just going to have to top, vote for the top three and hopefully that we get, um, you know, one vote may make it into the top three when you've got 18. Um, so we're pressed for time. I, we've, been given, we've been given a hard out to vote for three. So you need to go. Am I supposed to say this now? Okay. So what Anna is going to do, she's going to move it over to that web page I told you about, and you'll be able to vote there. So why don't you all begin type? Well. Uh, it's cfnp.org slash border. You may need to refresh the page repeatedly until Anna populates it with the material. Is it going to take you, how long will it take you to do that? Okay. So be patient. Is it working? CFNP.org. Oh, I was supposed to give everyone time to give closing remarks. Well, <laughs> uh, while we're waiting, afterwards, uh, Craig Huey and Jerry Corsi immediately outside are doing a book signings. So, uh, Craig, which book are you signing? Um, Silent No More. I'm going to be signing the Deep State 15 Surprising Dangers Thanks. You Should Know, but I also have a book called 23 Equity Crowdfunding Secrets, but what it is, it tells all the marketing tools that the progressive left use that conservatives, Christians, and libertarians don't. Oh, that's great. And then there's Jerry's book, Silent No More, and Jerry talked about his book this morning. He'll be out there. Um, so again, go to the website, cfmp.org uh, slash border. CFMP, is it work?
Oh, wow. What's up? Uh, Anna, you are the best. Okay, so you can vote. Let's all vote. No, there's more. Refresh it. If it's, if it's not a long list, refresh it. It'll be longer. Vote for three. You know, if I could encourage you to, if I would encourage you to add at least one election integrity related vote, so that there's that, that, that aspect, there's an action item for the broader membership on election integrity. So I will lobby for that, don't you think? If someone would like to harvest my ballot, you can practice your new skills. <laughs> Where's that ID one? How many are we supposed to vote? Three. I guess outlaw and use if legal ballot harvesting in all states. I would. That's an easy peasy one. And then you have the voter ID and citizenship verification. That's one I would recommend that we highlight. I think and citizen verifi citizenship verification is E-Verify is also good. I mean, you know, but we are limited to three. Okay. Okay, who, have you all voted? Now, we'll, do we have to wait for people, the results be, oh, wait, oh, wow, here we are. I gotta put my glasses on. Okay, it looks, a, it's literally a horse race here. Okay. <laughs> Lobby your state legislatures to do what? Hold Democrats accountable. It's a sanctuary policy. Okay, so it's worked out. What's the lobby your state registrators? Uh, Is that the E-Verify? Okay, so that's E-Verify wins, Democrats Accountable wins, and uh, uh, the Bile Harvesting one wins. That's good. <laughs> All right, thank you so much. Why should we vote Democrats? Well, you voted. I mean, we, we, we were, it's too late. We that's why when I went for whole politicians, Yeah, I mean, I appreciate your point, but thank you so thank much, you, Tom. Everyone, thank for you, everyone, for your time, and thank you to our guests for participating.